Okay, well, um, I will move ahead here then. Um, welcome back everybody. And uh, we will continue with um, Nariko Manabe's uh, presentation followed by discussion comments from um, Miriam Kingsburg Kadia. Um, Nariko is an Associate Professor of Music Studies at Temple University. She researches music in social movements and popular music in Japan and the Americas. Her monograph, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, Protest Music After Fukushima, won the John Whitney Hall Book Prize from the Association of Asian Studies, the BFE Book Prize from the British Forum for Ethnomusicology, and honorable mention uh, from the Allen, for the Allen Miriam Prize uh, for, from the Society for Ethnomusicology. Her second monograph, In Progress, posits the typology of intertextuality in protest music and the patterns by which these methods are used. She's the editor of 33 and a Third Japan, a book series on Japanese popular music from Bloomsbury Publishing, and is the co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Protest Music with Eric Drott, um, as well as being co-editor for uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear music with Jessica Schwartz. Um, Noriko, great to have you. Well, it's a, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, wish I was out there in Colorado. And um, um, thank you, Tim, for inviting uh, uh, me. And um, you know, thanks to Kate and to uh, Danielle and everybody else for organizing. So let me just um, share my screen. And let me move my controls. Okay, so the nuclear accident of 311 triggered the beginnings of the largest social movement that Japan had seen since the Anpo movement of the 1960s. Citizens were angered not only because the safety myth of nuclear power had been proven false, but also because of the handling of the accident, the lack of transparency regarding the radiation or the condition of the plant, and revelations of the nuclear village. They joined demonstrations that attracted as many as 200,000 protesters. Weekly protests in front of the prime minister's residence persisted for nine years. The anti-nuclear movement launched a protest cycle that evolved to protests against racism in 2013, the state secrets law in 2014, and the security bills of 2015, and protests for a higher minimum wage in 2016 and beyond. So this paper, considers sound as a technology of protest um, and as a means of participation and meaning making. Social movements in Japan had acquired a negative reputation due to the violence of some protests in the late 1960s and early 70s and were at a low ebb in 2011. Ordinary citizens had to muster up courage to protest. Chanting, singing, drumming, and other noise making played an important part in these protests encouraging demonstrators to speak out and engage onlookers in the street spectacle. I examined the ways in which social political circumstances, policing, urban acoustics, and landscape shape protest performance and participation. Drawing from fieldwork, I analyzed a feature of many Japanese protests, the sound truck piled high with speakers and sound equipment upon which DJs, rappers, and bands perform. The constraints placed by the police and the urban environment push Japanese protesters toward tactics that maximize audibility and participation, tactics that differ from those that I have seen in US protests. So as Roncier says, everything in politics turns on the distribution of spaces. Political action always acts upon the social as the litigious distribution of places and roles. But refiguring urban space is difficult in Japan. First, Wide open public spaces are in short supply, especially near symbols of power. Um, for those of you who have been to the Washington Mall, um, you will probably notice that this picture was probably taken uh, from the Lincoln Memorial. There is a huge expanse of well over a mile between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument. There's um, that length again, going all the way to the Capitol, which of course is a, is a literal source of political power. And, and so it's, it's quite easy to pack in millions of people for inaugurations or whatever uh, in this kind of space. But here is the equivalent of 
the capital in Japan. This is a Daya building. Um, this is a picture that was taken during the 2015 protests against the security bills. And as you can see, um, there are police buses that are lined up here. So I went to such a protest that has 75,000 people. And um, not only were these buses lined up so close together that you couldn't possibly fit a human being to go between those buses, but they were also continuing to run. So not only was there a physical barrier for the protesters to get out into this open road, but there was this kind of fumigation wall as well. And um, it, was, it was quite unpleasant. Uh, and uh, so you have about 75,000 people packed into the sidewalks here. And even though it's lit up over here, um, at the times that I went, uh, they actually cut out the street lights. So, um, you know, it was kind of creepy. And uh, you actually robbed us as the protesters from the potential of having a photo opportunity. So there's a huge difference between protesting here and protesting there. So because of this lack of uh, space for uh, having a protest, um, as many of you know, protests in Japan take to, tend to take place in shopping districts um, like the Ginza or Shibuya and protesters will choose which district they'll go through depending on what kind of audience they're hoping to attract. Because you know, at least if you go through one of these shopping centers, you're at least going to have an audience. That is the general idea. Now, um, the other thing that is quite noticeable about Japanese protests is that the police force seems disproportionately large at many Japanese protests. Um, in some cases, they could outnumber the protesters. So this was from a Shirodanaran uh, affiliated demonstration in February of 2012. Um, um, uh, Suginami Genpatsu, I think, was the official organizer. And um, as, this is just one part of a large squadron of police people that I think number maybe about 1500 just by counting the number of buses there were. And this particular protest attracted about 4,000 people in, as you know, outer Tokyo in Suginamiku. So it was really kind of over the top in my opinion. And, um, you know, sociologist Alex Vitale uh, tracks policing in protests. And he estimates that in New York, which is considered to be the most over-policed um, area in the United States for a protest under normal circumstances, if you have 100,000 person demonstrations in New York, there would be one police officer for every 25 protesters. But you know, my guesstimate is for Japanese demonstrations, there, there seem to be more like one officer for every 10 protesters maybe. So, um, so the police are a factor and uh, not only are there many of them, um, there are many members of the security police, some of them who are in plain clothes, who are, are taking notes and taking many photos of the protesters. And um, um, these photos are supposed to be filed. Um, the organizers thought that these photos were only of interest to the police if they were photographing the organizers. They weren't particularly interested in individuals, but still I found it quite intimidating to you know, have my picture taken at these kinds of protests because, and, and I think there were a lot of people who were quite intimidated as well because there was a rumor going around that if your photo is taken at a protest and if you were a student looking for a job or if, some, if you were somebody looking for a job, um, then you'll never get a government job because your photo would be out there. And, and so this was a disincentive, particularly for young people looking for jobs to protest. And of course, the other thing is that um, there were instances where the police would arrest people at a protest. Um, some of the protesters that I spoke to described various uh, incidents to me where um, the police would kettle people into a small area. Um, you know, this being Japan, you're shoulder to shoulder with everybody else. Um, they'd push one way and you'd involuntarily push back and then they would address, uh, um, arrest you for pushing at a police person or interfering with a police officer. Now, 
Once you're arrested, you could be detained for 23 days without an indictment. Uh, you wouldn't be able to call anybody except for a lawyer. Uh, you wouldn't be able to call your family or employee yours. Um, the average detention, I think, is about 10 days. Um, you could easily lose your job. Um, this is in great contrast to the U.S., where um, typically if protesters are arrested at a, at a protest in the U.S., you are kind of let go on your own recognizance, you know, after a day at most. So, you know, this kind of action intimidates many Japanese, particularly students or employees of well-known corporations, from joining protests. Uh, the police do everything in their power to make the protests look small. They surround the protest, making it invisible to passers-by. And uh, not only that, instead of letting the protesters take up the entire avenue, as you typically would in the U.S. protest, um, they'll typically restrict all the protesters to one lane of a multi-lane road. So you're marching beside speeding cars and, and um, motorcycles. So it's a little bit um, not very comfortable. And uh, not only that, um, they'll break up people into smaller blocks uh, that are several city blocks apart. So each one of these blocks may, might be a couple of hundred people. There may actually be as many as 200,000 people at these protests, but if you were um, just a regular person walking down the street and you saw this protest, you will say, oh, there was a protest and it was only a couple of hundred people. And you would never know that this is a, a 200,000 person protest because the next um, tranche of people were maybe you know, five or six blocks away. So you could see the head of such a, such a block here. Here's the head of the protest and it probably goes back to about here. So, um, so Japanese protest organizers try to compensate for the police's actions by dividing the protesters into blocks that are determined by sound. So there's typically a drum block there's typically a block that has a sound car with DJs on it. And there's often a so-called family block and Jintaramuta, the, um, uh, the chindom band that Maria Abe um, frequently plays with, um, they'll often play with the, with the family block and you know, they'll play songs like the theme from Ampamman to uh, keep the uh, protesters and children uh, occupied. And you'll probably have another block that is the more traditional protest block with unionists with megaphones. So these blocks encourage protesters to participate sonically, but they also partition people in ways that reflect, not absolutely, but reflect their socioeconomic class, age or family status. So this block system, which is a consequence of policing, creates greater consensus within the block. And it also kind of reduces the potential conflict within the block. Um, so what becomes clear from the block format is the centrality of sound in Japanese demonstrations. Japanese protest marches I have seen are actually much louder than American ones. This loudness makes tactical sense because if the police limits the visibility of a protest, activists can compensate by making the protest as loud as possible, occupying the streets with sound. And sounds can be effective in calling attention to the invisible. While a person can only see what is in front of them, they can hear in other directions. And sound is also exaggerated in an urban setting in which tall contiguous glass buildings form a sound canyon. So the taller the buildings are, the farther the sound will propagate with less volume loss. In, in other words, it'll propagate uh, further and louder and the longer it will resonate. So an urban environment retains and projects more sound than a less densely built environment. And most passersby are going to be hearing a demonstration before they see it. The sheer volume of a demonstration can redefine the behavioral boundaries imposed by the structural designs of the city and the actions of the police. And also um, bass sounds. Um, if you think about the kind of music that is played on a sound system, in a protest, it tends to be the bass heavy sounds of hip hop, house, techno, or reggae. And bass sounds are less absorbed by soft materials, they travel longer distances, and they can be felt, and they're also quite immersive. So, so, they can, so these bass sounds have kind of a strategic import 
in a sound uh, uh, demo. So uh, particularly powerful in Japanese protest marches are these sound trucks. They're bass heavy sound of hip hop and dance music are less absorbed uh, by soft materials and higher frequencies allowing them to reach longer distances and expand the de demonstration's oral horizon. So here's a taste of what one sounds like. <laughs> So in explaining how they became a staple in Japanese protests, let me explain uh, two theories. The first, uh, the political scientist uh, Charles Tilley noted that protest repertoires tend not to appear out of the blue, but result from incremental change in response to political opportunities. This tendency toward incremental change is correlated with increased participation as people are more likely to participate in chants songs and other practices with which they are already familiar. It suggests a natural preference for intertextuality and repetitiveness in protest sounds. And indeed, sound trucks had existed in other forms on Japanese streets. Nationalists have long blared military marches from trucks. And since the 1990s, LGBT parades have featured sound trucks blasting house music. Sound trucks and demonstrations were initiated in 2003 by a collective of artists, freelancers, and precariats called Against Street Control. They were protesting the war in Iraq, but more pointedly, they were protesting the privatization of public space. The sound truck dominated urban space through loud techno and noise, while the protesters following the truck took back street space by dancing and moshing. Hence, trucks with sound equipment had long been part of the political soundscape, but what was novel was to use them as performance stages and demonstrations and as a means of reclaiming urban space through sonic and physical presence. Sound trucks changed their musical style over time. Tom Torino categorizes musical performance in one of two styles, presentational, where artists play music for an audience who do not participate in the music making and participatory, which has no artist audience distinctions, only participants, and potential participants performing different roles. These approaches differ in both goals and aesthetics. Presentational music involves a separation between musicians and audience with musicians performing rehearsed pieces. They aim to entertain the audience and emphasize virtuosity, complexity, and showmanship. Most concerts are presentational. In contrast, a participatory performance aims to involve as many people as intensely as possible. As such, the music must be easy enough for newcomers to join in. It is comprised of short forms that are repeated over and over. While the repetitiveness may make the music uninteresting to an outside audience, it adds to the intensity of the performance for the participants. The emphasis is on inclusivity, regardless of the player's ability at the expense of showmanship. Because participatory music requires people to pay close attention to each other, it promotes social bonding. As William McNeil has noted, keeping together in time, moving big muscles together and chanting, singing, or shouting rhythmically promotes muscular bonding. Protesters often engage in participatory music that engages sounds and muscles, playing drums, chanting call and response patterns, marching along to the beat. This participation engenders social synchrony, which underpins feelings of social belonging and unity, a key goal of social movements. In a demonstration, performers shift along a spectrum between presentational and participatory styles, depending on the political situation and the immediate street environment. As mentioned earlier, demonstrations have long had a negative image in Japan and many Japanese regard protesting as radical and suspect. The earthquake, tsunami and nuclear accident in Fukushima in March, 2011, triggered the growth of the anti-nuclear movement and demonstrations in Japan quickly became frequent and with broad participation. In this environment, the style of the sound demonstration shifted from being centered on techno DJs to rappers who could enunciate claims regarding corruption in the Negro power industry and the handling of the crisis. In the beginning, the sound trucks aimed to attract people to the protest through music. The performances were presentational, consisting of prepared songs. Here's a performance of reggae singer Ranking Taxi at the first large scale anti nuclear demonstration in Koenji in April 2011. Okay, 
But the music also gave people the courage to raise their voices in a participatory manner. Futasugi Shin, who helped to organize the first large scale anti nuclear demonstration that you just saw, recounted a pivotal event that signaled future trends. He said, Mayuri was DJing to a huge crowd around the soundtrack. We were all very tense. It was still too soon after the disaster and none of us knew what to do. We were just following the truck, not raising our voices. Then Mayuri played a cool techno track. She cut the bass. And as we went into the intersection of Ome Kaido, she suddenly put the bass up and everyone began to cheer. Someone spontaneously yelled out, Genpats Yamero, or stop nuclear power. And without any leader, everyone joined in this chant. So the chant then spreads throughout this entire block. As Patasagi said, at that time, people were not yet accustomed to going to demonstrations, raising their voices or, or repeating call and response patterns. Everyone had a hard time doing that. Techno music gave us this huge push. Everyone, we can raise our voices. The music was the trigger. So I'll just play a little bit of it. Over the following year, in 2012, a new style of soundtrack performance developed that was more participatory with the audience. In the first year of anti nuclear protests, protesters had begun to chant slogans to drums. The activist Nome Yasumichi had the idea of leading these call and responses from on top of the soundtrack to a DJ's beats. He invited the rapper Akurio, who was a frequent participant in drum oriented protests, to perform in a way that would keep protesters engaged in call and response. And as the anti nuclear movement gave way to concerns regarding democratic rights, this style of protest was adopted by new protest groups. In December 2013, the state secrets law passed, making it a crime for anyone, be they a legislator, journalist, or activist, to leak a state secret, regardless of whether or not they knew it to be a state secret, by up to five years in jail. The law was widely regarded as having a chilling effect on investigative journalism and was condemned by the Japanese Bar Association and the UN Human Rights Council. In response, university students conducted a series of protests. The group later protested the security bills enabling Japanese troops to be sent overseas. So let's, uh, you'll see that the group is a little bit different here. Hence the soundtrack was a tool that overcame the constraints placed on Japanese protests, whereas the police worked to make protests less visible, the truck's height and sheer noise ensured that the protest would be seen and heard. It also attracted bystanders to join and gave protesters a forum in which they could participate. And in the age of social media, 
The soundtrack also affords many Instagrammable moments that don't end with the demonstration, but live in perpetuity in cyberspace. On July 29, 2012, an anti-Negro protest was held in the government district of Tokyo. The soundtrack rolled in front of the ministry, then in charge of both promoting and regulating nuclear power. This conflict of interest had caused a breakdown in oversight that was partly blamed for the nuclear accidents. The rapper Akurio began this freestyle. So, so this was a really dramatic and memorable moment, but it was a Sunday and the streets and offices were empty. Uh, I wondered if the moment had been wasted, but as the activist Il Commons explained to me, the real point is to protest against what the office symbolizes and have it on video. He said, even if no one is actually in the offices, and even if there's no audience in the streets, the cameras are on. When the videos are uploaded and streamed, they turn into a protest in their own right. The protest is not over once we leave the area. Even if the protest looks pointless at the time, the video seen afterwards gives it meaning at another level. So in other words, the video showing angry, passionate protesters criticizing a silent, unresponsive building, a symbol of unresponsive powers, invokes a strong emotional response in the viewer. Protesters are typically at their most passionate when they are at these symbolic spots. The rappers, drummers, and call leaders ratchet up their performances accordingly. These are the memorable moments at a demonstration when everyone is yelling at the top of their lungs and the sound is ricocheting off the building. The demonstrators are performing not only for themselves, but also for the audience that will see them later on YouTube. And even the shakiness of the camera will still capture that kind of excitement. So the soundtrack thus not only particip facilitates participation through chanting, but also affords the performance of these emotions, which are then archived. So the performance of democracy in the form of participatory sound in protest can differ due to cultural political circumstances. So we, we've seen in Japan, the behavior of the police accounts for many of the distinct aspects of the Japanese protests. The tendency to break up protests by type of sound to compensate for the police's minimization of protests, the persistence of sound trucks to assert sonic presence when the protest is made invisible, and the tendency to use sound trucks, drums, megaphones, and rehearsed chants to encourage participation. The kind of participation changed over time depending on political circumstances. Presentational performances help to draw people to protest at a time when citizens were not used to participating in protests. And once protests became seen as normal, the style shifted toward a more participatory mode. So having studied Japanese protests, I was struck by their differences with American protests. In contrast to the restrictive movements of Japanese protests, the 2017 Women's March in New York was an unmissable spectacle that took up the entirety of Fifth Avenue, it did not require sound to the same degree. And unlike Japanese protests, no one was designated as a call leader with a megaphone. And instead, individual protesters would spontaneously chant here and there, never seeming to engage the entire mass of protesters. So US protests seem to have a different conception of democratic or participatory sounds, sacrificing the sense of unity of Japanese protests in favor of this kind of chaotic autonomy. Even in a US protest, however, there are power differentials. For example, some minorities believe that protests like the Women's March are really meant for white people, and they complain that their chants are often ignored relative to those started by white protesters. This racial hierarchy has caused a visible racial segregation in protests where fewer minorities are coming to some protests and protesters at the same demonstration tend to congregate around similar looking people. Hence, while demonstrations may attempt to prefigure an idealized democracy, 
I see them not as embodiments of, of a participatory democratic ideal, so much as a manifestation of the democracy that society allows, even for that brief moment of the demonstration. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Noriko. That was, uh, thank, you, and thank you for that sonic experience. That was great, <laughs> um, so fun and um, really interesting too. Um, so we have some comments now from um, Miriam Kingsford, Kingsford Kadia, uh, who is Associate Professor of History here at the University of Colorado at Boulder, uh, specializing in the study of modern Japan. Uh, Miriam's the author of Moral Nation, Modern Japan and Narcotics in Global History, as well as Into the Field, Human Scientists of Transport Japan. Uh, she's also published articles in the Journal of Asian Studies, Journal of Japanese Studies, Monumenta, Monumenta Nipponica, uh, Comparative Studies in Society and History, Modern Asian Studies, and many other journals and collected um, and, and, and edited collections. Um, in recent years, she has held fellowships through the American Council of Learned Societies and the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. And she's currently working on a history of time accounting um, in Showa and Heisei, Japan. So Miriam, over to you, thank you. Hi everybody, can you all hear me? Yeah. Fantastic, okay. Um, Dr. Manabe, thank you so much for your fascinating paper. Um, hi everybody, I'm Miriam Kadia. And before I begin, I'd like to express my gratitude to Tim for organizing this workshop. Um, I'm very honored to be included. It's hard for me to believe that 10 years have passed since 3.11. Back in 2011, I had already been at CU for a couple of years um, and I was on leave on a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, after the triple disaster, the Reischauer Center for Japanese Studies there basically threw out its prearranged agenda for the rest of the calendar year um, and started hosting weekly speakers, experts and events on various topics related to the events in Tohoku. Um, and it also created uh, what, um, what it appears that you worked on uh, the Japan Disasters Digital Archive Project, which um, it's an online repository of materials that the website states seeks to collect, preserve, and make broadly accessible many forms of firsthand information and primary documentation of the events of March 11th, 2011 and their aftermath. So um, for me, in those sad and anxious early weeks and months, following the disaster, um, it was a great comfort to be surrounded by a community committed to victim assistance, commemoration, and understanding. Um, and now, 10 years later, I'm grateful for the opportunity to mark this anniversary with, with such an important event. So Dr. Manabe's paper is firmly situated within the growing subfield of sound studies. My first introduction to this discipline was coincidentally also at Harvard when um, my fellow postdoc, Marie Abe, who is now an ethnomusicologist at BU, gave a fascinating talk on chingonya, um, which is traditional ostentatiously costumed street musicians who work as advertisers for small neighborhood businesses. And her book, Resonances of Chingonya, Sounding Space and Sociality in Contemporary Japan was published in 2018. Um, and it came to mind as I read Dr. Monabe's paper, given the shared interest in sound as a political practice. Um, and then of course, I saw that the book was cited in the pre-circulated draft. So um, a major focus of Dr. Manabe's paper is sound trucks, which feature in some of my earliest memories of Japan. Growing up in Tokyo in the 1990s, I remember sound trucks regularly coming through our neighborhood at all hours, blaring military marches and exhorting citizens to revere the emperor and restore his authority. Um, so I've mostly associated sound trucks with the extreme right. And in fact, when I looked online to find some clips to show as part of my remarks, um, those that were careening around waving the rising sun flag were more or less all I could find. Um, so it was particularly interesting to me to consider their association with the democratic right to assemble um, in what are now called sound demos. <clears throat> 
So Dr. Manabe's paper begins by briefly surveying the history of sound and protest in contemporary Japan. Um, and this is a topic I found particularly interesting in light of my own recent research on the 1968 student movement. Um, and she describes the shift from presentational performance, which features an artist playing to an audience, to participatory performance in which such boundaries are blurred or eliminated altogether. She then argues that sound emerged as a key strategy in Japanese street demonstrations due to the relatively stiff obstacles that these events have to surmount, including public apathy, a relative absence of public space near the centers of power, um, and historians have noted this as an intentional feature of modern urban planning in Tokyo, generally negative impressions of protests, over-policing, and um, I think most importantly, spatial interference to minimize the perceived size of assembled crowds. So through acoustic occupation of the streets, protesters can counteract misleading visual representations of their numbers and make their true scope felt. So this case study of the demonstration really emerges as a highly effective vehicle for showing the intimate and at times contradictory and at times symbiotic relationship between sound and space. In deploying sound as a mobilization strategy, sound trucks are particularly useful due to their height and mobility. Um, these qualities enable them to be seen and heard by protesters forced by the police to spread out, um, and of course by bystanders as well. Uh, they're also very effective in crowded downtown shopping districts, uh, like the ones that we saw. They tend to be enclosed by tall, contiguous glass structures that facilitate acoustic transmission and resonation. Protesters consciously play to this built environment, uh, pun intended, with low bass music that can be heard at long distances. And the overall effect is very empowering for participants. In this day and age, Dr. Manabe notes, protests can also be recorded and put on YouTube and Instagram, thus multiplying the audience. So I had come prepared with a clip on YouTube in case Dr. Manabe didn't have time in her presentation to show us a demonstration, but um, I, I should have known better. Um, and since we did have an opportunity to see a couple already, I'll, I'll just skip it. Um, while observing that the snippets that she showed us really speak to how protesters use sound to defeat space and affect unity. Uh, the protesters march alongside the cars in a very spread out arrangement, but singing and repetitive chants allow for a kind of participatory performance that generates a palpable sense of energy and enthusiasm. Uh, while we were viewing the clips that she showed us, I had a hard time sitting still in my seat, uh, but my camera was on, so uh, I forced myself. Uh, Dr. Maname reports that demonstrators are highly conscious of the power of film, with some even going so far, like um, as in the last case she showed us, um, as to believe that their main impact is through um, this kind of wider distribution. So it occurs to me that at least for the YouTube or Instagram audience, protesters can regain some agency over space through their filming choices. Um, for instance, close-up shots in which demonstrators fill the frame can sort of mitigate police efforts to break them up visually in real life. At the same time, though, the effectiveness of the acoustic experience seems somewhat compromised to me because most secondary viewers probably won't listen to the clips at the sort of uncomfortable volume that you would experience in person. Um, so I'd love to hear more about how the demonstrators think about and curate their intended sonic effect in recordings. How does the transfer to film change the relationship between the sound and the space? Um, and also, without wanting to take too much more time away from the general Q&A, um, I also would like to invite Dr. Monabe to tell us a little bit more about her research process. Uh, you mentioned that this paper is based on fieldwork, and I'd love to know more about the kinds of experiences that you sought out and engaged in, obviously over, over quite a long time frame. Um, the people that you talk to, your informants, whatever you'd like to share. Um, I'm particularly wondering, I guess, about a 
couple of roles in the demonstrations. Sound truck drivers, um, who, who are they? How do they balance these um, sort of dueling responsibilities to public safety and enthusiasm for their cause? Um, is this a consistent position with clearly outlined duties or does it simply rotate among people with licenses? Um, and police, how do they feel about the use of sound to circumvent their spatial efforts? Is this something that they think about consciously? Um, and lastly, I'm also curious about where this paper fits into what seems to be a larger project on the politics of sound in contemporary Japan, uh, if you'd like to say a few words about that. So I'll pass the baton back now. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, Miriam. Over to you, Noriko. Well, thank you very much for your uh, for your very thoughtful comments. Um, uh, that was very interesting to hear. So, um, where do I start? So, the intended sonic effect. Um, how do you keep that in a film situation? I would say it's actually pretty hard. Um, it's very hard to um, to duplicate that feeling of being surrounded by sound, particularly when it involves a low bass, which, you know, you can feel in your chest and you, you know, it really does make you feel surrounded uh, in sound. I think that's that kind of tactile response is very difficult to uh, replicate. And I, uh, you know, I, I think that's, I think that's hard to do. That having been said, um, a lot of these um, people who take films of the protests are actually professional photographers. Um, God, I'm blanking out on the guy's name, but um, there was there was one person in particular who um, actually took some of the shots that I ended up using in my book because uh, his pictures were better than mine. And um, you know, he he sometimes um, would come to these protests. Um, dressed like a ninja actually and um and he had a really beautiful camera set up with a really good sound uh system which you can which you can hear on, in his videos um and then um there were other people who would come to the uh demonstration you know with a tripod and a and this huge microphone and everything else and they would have a better surround sound kind of effect on their YouTube. So I think it really depends on who's taking the video. Um, obviously I took the first video that you saw because I'm not a very good photographer and you saw my, my finger in there. <laughs> but um, but, but uh, I think it depends on, on who's doing it, but, but you're right. I think it's really hard to uh, replicate the sonic experience. Um, in terms of my research process, um, I came upon this uh, topic really as a continuation of other things I was doing. So um, I was in Japan on a Japan Foundation Fellowship in 2011-2012. Uh, and um, I went in at the very end of 2011. And a lot of the musicians that so I went with the intention of writing a book about Japanese club cultures and music. And a lot of the contacts that I already had, like ECD and Ranking Taxi, have become prominent members of the anti nuclear movement. Um, they, were one, they were among the people who were performing on those soundtracks. And um, I talked to them and um, they said, well, you know, this stuff is really important and they kind of told me why they thought it was important. And I started to look into it and I realized that, um, you know, it was, it, it brought very large issues about um, how fragile democracy is in many democratic countries. And, um, you know, uh, the, the lack of transparency in decision-making or policy setting or the way that um, public opinion does or does not interact with governmental policy, um, you know, whether or not the media feels impelled to show protest or not show protest. There was a reason why my book is titled The Revolution Will Not Be Televised because it definitely will not be in Japan. And, um, you know, so, so those kinds of issues also resonate with me, with me. And I thought, well, this is actually a much more important issue than club culture in Japan. So I 
went to a lot of protests and I spoke to a lot of musicians who were involved in the anti nuclear movement. I went to a lot of concerts and festivals that were involved with this. I analyzed a lot of music and um, I got to know several of the organizers. So that was my research process. And I kept going back to Japan when there was um, going to be a major protest and they were pretty predictable in terms of time. And when I couldn't make a major protest, I would typically, um, they were usually um, either IWW or um, somebody was twit casting the thing live. And so I watched a lot of protests live if I couldn't make it. Uh, that was staying up very, very late or waking up very early in the morning. And, um, and so that was how I, I wrote my book. And uh, was there anything else you wanted me to, uh, I should probably let somebody else ask a question, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, yeah, well, yeah, that's, let's start with that. Um, we'll see if, uh, if people have any um, questions they want to uh, jump in with. Uh, Hiroko has one, so let's go, let's go there. Yeah, thank you so much for the fascinating talk, Noriko. Um, I was wondering if um, whether and how these trucks travel outside the urban context and what kind of a kind of a democratic soundscape it might create. And I'm asking because it reminded me of um, when Odaka Station within the 20 kilometer zone was opened up and you know there was a ceremony of the first arrival of the train and there was um, one resident of a different town, but within the evacuation zone, who's also who also goes to these Tokyo protests, who brought his truck and blasted his message as the as the you know the train was arriving because there's there's the media there and trying to capture that moment, and he really wanted to disrupt disrupt that moment, and I it just made me think about what that what kind of a, you know a soundscape that is, in in terms of you know how it imagines democracy perhaps. Um, and another question I had was about power differentials. Um, so um, you show the power differentials in your talk between the police and protesters. But at the end, you also talk about, you know, the context of the US where the Women's March was um, taken up as something for like, white people. And I was wondering if there was something similar going on um, at all in the, um, the, the pro context of the protest that you were looking at too. And um, I'm also asking this because um, my interlocutors in coastal Fukushima was quite explicit about avoiding, uh, just not being wanting to be part of um, these movements. And that's part of um, one of the reason is what Rio mentioned is that because of the language that it uses that really kind of um, represents Fukushima in a, in a certain way. And so I was wondering if that kind of came up at all in your research. Yeah, and thank you so much again. Yes, yeah, so um, that, idea of the power differential as, as Tokyo as the metropolis and uh, Fukushima as the periphery, that language was talked about and, and several of the protest organizers were very uh, sensitive about that. Um, but um, there, there was an inherent tension between the um, anti-nuclear movement and the locals in Fukushima that was quite palpable. And I think the most um, palpable example of that that I came across was the um, Project Fukushima. So um, I'd gone to that particular festival um, somewhat later in the cycle and I spoke with Otomo Yoshihide and I also spoke at length with uh, Endo Michiro who were two of the organizers. Um, both of whom have strong ties to Fukushima. And um, one of the things that um, both of them wanted to make clear was that, um, and I think is, especially with Otomo, um, he didn't want Project Fukushima to be an ex explicit protest um, against nuclear power because of the, um, the difficult position that a lot of people from Fukushima were in because um, he felt that a lot of the people in Fukushima felt a sense of shame for having accepted nuclear power for various reasons to um, sustain their community or whatnot. And, and, and uh, so there was that aspect of it. 
and you know and then there's this this whole issue of stigmatization that um you know some of the anti-negro protesters but not all of them uh were aware of and certainly um certainly otomo was quite um familiar with that whole dynamic and so you know otomo's whole point with project fukushima was just to have people from the metropoles you know whether it be tokyo or osaka um come up to fukushima for a day and just see how people had to live there that that was that was his point it was a much more you know he he said that you know if you talk to anybody involved with the project you'll understand what how they really feel but they explicitly did not want to label it an anti-nuclear protest it's um we have a, a really interesting also a question in the chat um Enrico, do you want i don't know if you've had a chance to look at it but um uh yeah uh, i am you know sound as technology of protest might inform interact with and even compete with sound as a technology of containment. Um, what kind of use of music sound by the establishment immediately after 311, um, you know, was was there? Uh, you mentioned in passing the March of Anpan, uh It was used by protesters, but also by the Japanese military band um, where children and mothers were their primary target. Um, so some competition was going on within the sonic space. Well, sure, because um, um, as as we all know, the uh, the byword in two thousand and eleven was kizuna, right? So um, actually, Maria Abe in the um, chapter that she's given to us for the um, Oxford Handbook of Protest Music talks about this, uh, where you know Arashi and uh, at the Kohaku for two thousand and eleven is singing this song about kizuna, and um, you know, there are all these kinds of, you know, togetherness uh, kinds of songs and, and, you know, to what degree, you know, you know, to, to what degree is there sincerity in, in some of these songs. So um, I know that a lot of the rappers and pro, um, protest musicians that I dealt with uh, were very critical of that whole um, discourse of Kizuna. So uh, one of the rappers I follow is a guy named Dengaryu, who is from Yamanashi Prefecture. And um, uh, he released an album um, uh, that um, called, uh, which was called Like a B2 Movie, Like a B Movie. And uh, in one of the songs, as a prelude to another song, um, he records something that sounds like it was sampled from a radio show. And I think it actually was sampled from a radio show where um, a caller uh, into a talk radio show is saying, uh, what is this nonsense about Kizuna? What do you mean about Kizuna? You're, you've abandoned all these people. Um, um, you're not trying, really trying to help them. Um, where is the aid? You know, they've been left without homes. You know, what is what is Kizna in a country like that? So, yeah, there there was a lot of debate about the different kinds of sounds that um, are 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 out there in 2011 and 2012. Great. Um, let's have one final question from Yo, and uh, and then we'll have to move on to um, our final presentation for the afternoon real thank you noriko um this question is maybe a little bit strange because uh, uh, i'm not that familiar with protests and stuff but when i hear about all these sound making practices make me you know think of two things one is the you know sort of like a, a sport like cheering stuff like a baseball right <laughs> where like they just bring about instruments and then just play out and cheer athlete another one is the um you know more of the subversive one of the bosozoku where the noise of the motorcycles as a way to sort of express their you know frustration or whatever have you <laughs> right so those two like different sort of soundscape example came to me and then you know 
And then in this context, like it makes me think about the sort of like sensitivities or the lower threshold for the Japanese people with regards to sound, right? Like in everyday life, we're kind of trying not to make sound because your neighbor might be very close, <laughs> you know, the apartment issue is always about hearing somebody else like move in and then, you know, that's a problematic, right? So I was wondering like what, you know, you know, what might be specific to Japanese with regard to sound, you know, in, as a way of, you know, expressing their discomfort or, you know, disapproval of something and then how, you know, this kind of protest uh, might tell us about Japanese relationship to, you know, sound in general. That's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, so, so I did most of my field work in large cities and especially in the Shibuya area, which as you know, is an extremely loud place with lots of um, what people would call masking sounds of trains stopping in Harajuku and cars whizzing by on Oyamadori or, or, and not to mention all the video screens going off at Hachiko Square. So the sound truck is there to compete against all that noise to a large degree. So, so I think there's, there's, there's a, a certain kind of uh, uh, noisy competition um, uh, thing involved. Um, but when you're, you're um, so, so this, con this relates to Hiroko's um, question earlier, which I didn't think I really answered, uh, which is about um, where the sound trucks actually are used. And, and I know that they've been used in many of the big cities like Hokkaido, Tokyo, um, um, Kyoto, Osaka, and Fukuoka. But um, I don't really hear about them in less populated areas where I think what you're talking about in terms of the sensitivity of sound really comes into play. And um, even in, say, a place like Koenji, which of course is known for all its you know, punk bands and everything, um, even they are you know, pretty cognizant of which neighborhood they're going into. So sometimes a Koenji demonstration or a Suginami demonstration will not always be on Omikaido, which is the big boulevard. You know, sometimes they'll go into somewhat smaller residential areas and they do try to kind of tone it down in those areas. So there is kind of a sensitivity to what is appropriate, I think, in some of those places, although probably still louder than the kind of normal sound practice as you're 